For the last century or so, epic storytelling has been married to one medium in particular, film. Of course, the word epic is drastically overused these days. All you need in your movie is a guy in a cape to be considered such. But there is a true form of epic cinematic storytelling. We see it in modern geek staples like Star Wars and The Lord of the Rings. Star Wars is famously simplistic in its inspiration from the studies of Joseph Campbell in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. The quote-unquote hero's journey is the basis for epic storytelling. How does this all relate to German silent cinema? The first is Metropolis, director Fritz Lang's overzealous, massively produced, then unprecedented science fiction extravaganza. The second is the less famous of the two in popular culture, but definitely worth viewing. Sunrise by F.W. Murnau. It's especially important when talking about the approaches taken at epic storytelling during this period of cinema. But first we should probably define what we mean by the hero's journey. The traditional way to think about this structure is in a large circle consisting of two semicircles, the ordinary world on top and the special world on the bottom. Our hero begins at the top at a state of rest. He is then challenged or called upon a quest by some character or inciting incident. Then he moves along down into the special world to confront a great danger or trial. He meets allies and enemies and wise old mentors along the way, all the while facing some fatal flaw within himself. Eventually, he begins to make his way back to the ordinary world, having learned something while in the special world. And just as he is ready to move on back to regular life, he must face one last enemy. This is the climax. But finally, the hero eases back into his regular life. It's all rather familiar. It's the basis on which most of Western storytelling is framed. Why is this important when talking about German directors in the late 20s and early 30s? We'll start by discussing Sunrise. Directed by F.W. Murnau, it tells the story of a humble married couple living in a non-distinct countryside. The setting feels homey, pastoral, and nostalgic. It can be best described as a picturesque vision of antiquity, a mid-1800s pre-industrial revolution cultural memory. If we follow the model of the hero's journey, this is presented as our ordinary world. But what is important to point out in the context of that format is how Murnau visually introduces us into that world. He starts us in a train station, and then we are transported through a montage of modernity. We see city aristocrats on vacation, sailing in boats, celebrating, and, and passing the time. Then we find ourselves in the beautiful scenery of the countryside, home to the man and the wife. But not so fast. The first character that we meet is the sultry woman from the city. Like us, she is a tourist here. Once we do meet the man and the wife, we learn that they are unhappy and the man is having an affair with the woman from the city. She begs him to kill his wife and leave with her. And that, dear friends, is our inciting incident. Then, of course, he tries to kill his wife at sea. He fails, and they drift literally and figuratively into a new world, the city. This crossing of the ocean is reminiscent of a Homeric tale like the Odyssey. We watch as the man tries to alleviate the wife's fears and mend their relationship. This is where the most important sequence of the film occurs. The arrival into the city is accented by the couple waiting, frightened, through the busy modern traffic. They've begun to come back together. Then they go into a church and symbolically get remarried, conveniently at the exact middle of the film's runtime. And then what happens? They go back outside, back into the traffic, and they are fine. They don't even watch the cars. Murnau employs a form of optical printing so we can see how effortlessly and almost supernaturally the couple sits through the speeding vehicles, daydreaming of a country road. From there, the bulk of the film's remainder is a honeymoon. We watch the quaintness of this couple as they navigate the modern world, and then they return home once again by sea. But the film isn't done with them yet. The wife supposedly drowns, reflecting the man's murder attempt earlier. In anger, he tries to kill the woman from the city as a way to cope, but then his wife is returned to him, and they live happily ever after. Or perhaps upon further thinking, happily enough, for now. You see, Sunrise is about cycles, much like the path of the Earth around the sun continuous. It is a film about the consistencies in us all and through the way of life. Though it ends happy, there is no indication that the couple has really changed. You might recall a flashback from the beginning of the film that shows how happy they used to be. The ending then shows them back at that level of happiness and content. But who is to say that they will stay that happy this time? The man doesn't really learn from his fatal flaw, which is that he cannot make himself happy and lashes out this insecurity in the form of murderous violence. Sunrise is so dedicated to the idea of the hero's cyclical journey that it doesn't allow its hero to truly change for the better. Metropolis is an even more fascinating approach to telling an epic story. From a purely visual and production level standpoint, it certainly lends itself to the term epic. 
the sets and matte paintings and projections convey a sense of scale that still feels big in our jaded era of moviegoing. You believe the world of Metropolis from the very first minute. The sheer scope that Fritz Long presents physically and thematically is the biggest, boldest investment in classical myth-making that the film has to offer. Then, once we meet our protagonist, Freighter, we're off to the races. He lives a pleasant life of leisure and celebration, and then he is spellbound one day by Maria. In his pursuit of her, he finds himself in the working-class underworld, the special world in his hero's journey. But then things take a turn. We jump to the house of Rotwang, a mad scientist, and begin to follow the journey of him and Joe Frederson. They are members of the upper class, and what we begin to see in the film is a parallel plot structure. We watch as two classes intermingle and approach toward a single unifying point. It can be thought of as an, an angle, or for easier purposes, a triangle. The head, the hands, and the heart. There are two key scenes we should pay attention to in Metropolis. The first is the initial sermon in the cave that Maria delivers to a crowd of poor, overworked onlookers. It's here that she tells the story of the Tower of Babel, reworked slightly to better suit the filmmaker's needs. The obvious takeaway from the scene is that Maria is the embodiment of all things holy. Just look at how she's lit. Candles cast a softly defined but overpowered glow on her. Also notice how the camera and the actress Brigitte Helm feed off of one another. She stares above the crowd, seeing something divine, and in turn the camera looks right back at her. Not once during the scene does she look at the crowd. The other half of this scene is, of course, Joe Frederson and Rotwang staring down at this mass. They are at once a part of it and outside of it. See how long frames them in mostly darkness, only their faces illuminated by Maria's divinity. Our second scene is the seducing of the elite, cross-cut with Frater's hallucinations. Here we're witness to an orgy of temptation and damnation. Machine Maria is inseparable from the horror of Babylon. This android, a marvel of modern machinery, is equated to an ancient Babylonian demon. There's no clearer condemnation of modernity than this in Metropolis. Look how the Machine Maria is gazed upon by a collage of eyes. This image is pretty sickening to watch. The way the dance she performs distorts time and space through faded cuts and dissolves is strange, even if we do consider the unreliable narration of Freighter's hallucinatory state. But the real reason this is important in the context of epic storytelling is that traditionally, gods are looked at as guiding beings in a story. They come to our hero in a time of need and provide some aid. I mean, hell, the entirety of the Iliad is warring factions of gods helping warring factions of humans. By poisoning the one divine figure in the film, the filmmakers are breaking down our collective faith in a higher power, further destabilizing the traditional structure. By taking these two threads that make up its world, the upper class and the lower class, and driving the plot through their intermingling, Metropolis has created a wonderfully clever epic story. The two threads thrust together in a point, meeting in the center at the end, at a church, as they reach towards the future and towards God. The story of Joe Frederson and Rotwang, their long-lost love, Hell, and the story of Maria, Freighter, 11811, and Josephet, they converge at a point higher than they both were before, both having changed for the better. The structure of the narrative itself is a, a monument, a pyramid, a tower, if you will. So what are we left with in terms of structure with these two films? One appears to be more beholden to the methods of old, even if it does go a little too far by making its protagonist undergo zero change. It is an almost perfect circle coming back to bite itself in the rear. The other is a complete subversion of the epic storytelling mode, trying less to say something about the individual human experience and more about the experience of humankind. Sunrise is about the pervasiveness of constants in the world. There will always be a man and his wife, and they will always have troubles and happy times alike. Metropolis instead points to something. Its entire structure flows towards one inevitable crucial point, which centers on a fundamental change within the way humanity works. A hopeful change. But what do both films have in common? The scale. They are about vast journeys that clueless individuals take either on behalf of themselves or the behalf of others. Epic storytelling is one in one with cinema, and it is in this period of filmmaking, the most adventurous period of filmmaking if you ask me, that directors could test these limits of genre and structure. 